Hey guys, I'm Heidi Preeb. Welcome back to my channel, or welcome to my channel if you're new here. Today we are continuing a series on each of the attachment styles, each of the insecure attachment styles, so avoidant, anxious, and fearful avoidant, and what it is that causes them to perpetually make the same types of mistakes in relationships. And this can be applied not just to relationships, but to basically any area of your life where your attachment patterning is showing up. So for a lot of people that might be work, it might be friendships or family relationships, but the relationships that tend to be the most painful and kind of cause us the most distress tend to be romantic relationships. So we're gonna focus predominantly on those throughout the course of this video, but feel free to take this and apply it to whatever area of your life it applies to. So I wanna start off by saying that I do not think that anybody of any attachment style, secure, avoidant, anxious, fearful avoidant, gets out of a bad relationship or finishes some period of their life where things went really wrong and goes, okay, I'm gonna do no reflecting, I'm just gonna barrel forward into the future and do the exact same thing again and hope for different results. There's an Einstein quote that goes something along the lines of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And so what I'm not here to do is call anybody insane. I believe from the bottom of my heart that almost everybody, once exiting a bad situation, does take the time to reflect and go, okay, what could I do differently in the future, right? How can I avoid falling back into that same kind of trap that I was in in my last relationship, my last job, my last friend group? And how do I make sure that in the future, I'm not doing more of the same thing? And then for a lot of us, what happens is we go into the next situation that looks different on the surface, but down the line ends up repeating the same pattern. And then a lot of us are like, okay, how did I end up here? Like I really thought I had internalized some of these red flags, figured out where some of these problem areas are, and yet I got more of the same thing in a different form, right? And the reason this happens, and it happens for all insecure styles in particular, is because most of the time, the repetitive problems that we experience in life are originating from a psychological blind spot. So what we tend to do when we're reflecting on past situations is go, okay, what did I do well, right? And then the natural impulse is to double down on that. But what we tend to neglect is the information that's in our blind spot. So the things we are doing that we don't know we're doing because our brains have kind of hidden this information from ourselves. And the thing is, that's the stuff we actually need to learn from. So I want you to think of it kind of like you're riding a tricycle and you have two wheels on the back, right? And one of them is completely deflated and the other one is kind of half pumped up. And so what we do when we're trying to double down on our strengths, but we have an insecure attachment style is kind of like we're trying to take the wheel that's already partially inflated and pump it up even more, right? Because we can't see the other wheel that's in our blind spot. And then we might get on our bike our tricycle and go, okay, I'm 100% sure now that this wheel is so pumped up, it's so round, it functions so well. And then we get on that bike and start immediately driving in circles because a tricycle needs its two back wheels in order to move forward in a straight direction. So for the anxious attachment style, what is that wheel, that strength that you have, that thing you do really well, and what is that deflated wheel that's gonna cause you to go in circles until you attend to it? That's what we're gonna talk about over the course of this video. So that's a long way of saying what we're gonna look at here is what your strengths naturally are in relationships and how that strength, if left unbalanced, can actually become a weakness or a vice, something that's holding you back from what you want. So for the anxious attachment style, that overinflated wheel is preoccupation or fixation on other people's behavior. So let's talk about why this is a strength and then we'll talk about why it holds you back. So the anxious attachment style, I think more so than any other attachment orientation, has this incredible openness to learning through love. And that sounds like a simple thing when you say it, but coming from the other side of the spectrum, I can promise this is not available to a lot of people. This is not a skill that particularly those who are more avoidant really know how to access and use inside of themselves. And it's an incredible, incredible trait that having this attachment orientation allows you to access frequently. 
So when those who have an anxious attachment style go into relationships, they tend to go in very much with their hearts open and their souls bared, ready to learn, ready to grow with their partner, ready to be taught through the process of loving someone. And I think that that is an absolutely vital component of making a relationship work. The ability to go, you know what? I'm willing to table or suspend a lot of the things that I strongly think and believe and really be open to learning about another person, learning about their experience of being alive, what it's like to be them in this world, and allow myself to be transformed and changed through the process of loving and being loved by someone. And this is something that you absolutely need to be able to do to form a secure partnership with someone. That vulnerability and that openness to let yourself be seen completely by another person is an absolutely vital component of love and you should not lose it. But let's talk about what happens when we don't balance out that strength with the other side of things. So when you have someone who is completely vulnerable, completely open, completely willing to accept and run towards whatever love they're able to find, what you also have is a person who isn't particularly protected. And in a best case scenario, this type of vulnerability and openness is what we come into the world with, right? I always kind of picture when I think of this energy, like an image of a little baby lying on its back in the crib with its arms up above its head, just completely and totally open and vulnerable and willing to let the world take care of it. And that energy, again, is so important to keep with us as adults, but it's also an energy that lacks self-protection right? Because who is responsible for that baby's well-being? It's caretakers. And as we grow up as children, if we're able, if we are raised in environments that allow us to keep that kind of open, vulnerable energy alive in us, ideally we learn through the care and attentiveness of the adults in our lives how to protect ourselves alongside that. So when it's safe to be in that energy and when it's not so safe to be there, and in the cases where it's not so safe to be in that energy, how do we protect ourselves? How do we show up for ourselves, learn to set boundaries around that energy, and understand when it's time to step out of it? So when is it time to not be a student? When is it time to not be completely receptive? And as we grow up, specifically if we grow up with secure patterning, we also learn, when is it time for me to step into my adult self and be protective over other people, as opposed to always being in that position of being so vulnerable, so open to being taught, and consequently, leaving ourselves undefended. Because here's the thing, just as much as secure relating requires that openness and vulnerability and willingness to compromise and work together, it also requires, in perfectly equal part, the ability to stay self-regulated, to step out of our own vulnerability, and to protect and set boundaries for ourselves, and to be able to do that on kind of a frequent daily basis in a variety of situations, right? If we are always saying yes to what others want from us, if we are that open and that willing and that vulnerable, then somebody else inevitably has to set our boundaries for us because we're behaving the way a kind of innocent, trusting child would behave in the world. And I think that a lot of the time in relationships, when anxious individuals are getting really angry at their partners, the underlying anger is coming from a place of why aren't you setting my boundaries for me, right? Instead of me figuring out what do I need to stay regulated, healthy, and balanced in the world, why aren't you as my partner doing that for me? Why aren't you anticipating and responding to my needs? Why aren't you noticing and responding to the ways in which this relationship dynamic isn't working? And what's in your blind spot here is your own self-responsibility. In a relationship that functions healthily, both partners are aware of where their boundaries lie, and they're also able to communicate those boundaries. And that communication of boundaries, sometimes on a daily basis, is what keeps a relationship functioning healthily as opposed to getting enmeshed. So what a lot of anxious types tend to do when they get out of a very enmeshed relationship is go, okay, I'm gonna do what I know how to do well, which is focus intently on other people's behavior. So I'm gonna get really clear on all of the things that my partner did wrong, 
all of the things about my partner that were toxic or unhealthy, all of their behaviors that didn't work for me, and I'm gonna go into the next relationship more aware of what all of those red flags are. And so what ends up happening is you might feel like, okay, in each partnership, I'm definitely getting less and less of the really bad stuff, but I'm never quite getting there in terms of that secure, connected relationship that I really want. And the reason that happens is that no matter how far away you get from those really bad behaviors, you're never going to have that secure, connected relationship until you can inflate that other wheel and figure out how to bring a more self-protected version of yourself into a relationship right? So that means not seeing your partner as responsible for setting your boundaries for you. So what you might think you're doing is working towards a secure, healthy, connected relationship, but what's actually happening is you're just shifting the goalpost in terms of what an ideal partner looks like to you. And the problem is that as long as you are looking for that ideal partner who is going to take away all of your pain, know what you're thinking and feeling before you do, and respond perfectly to you all of the time, you are going to be stuck in this loop of suffering because there is no partner who can do that. There is no partner who is healthy who wants to do that, and that part's really important, right? If you find a partner who likes to play that role of chronically being a teacher and a caretaker, it's likely that that person has some unhealthy patterning that's causing them to do that, and that's gonna cause even more problems down the line. So in order to get out of this loop of endless suffering, the solution is not get better and better at identifying the type of savior you want to find, because unconsciously that's what you're looking for, right? The solution lies in understanding that you are responsible for teaching yourself a lot of the things that you kind of missed the first time around. So let's talk about what some of those things are. When we are young and we are vulnerable and we get hurt, ideally we have a caregiver or someone in our lives who can teach us to translate the pain we feel into boundaries that we need to have. In order to set healthy boundaries, we have to kind of know who we are and what matters to us. And this is another thing that tends to be in the blind spot for a lot of anxiously attached individuals, is this strong sense of who am I? what matters to me in life, and where am I going in life? And if you don't have those things in place, it's gonna be really hard for you to set boundaries because you don't know what you're protecting with your boundaries, right? It's kind of like someone going, okay, here is the materials to build a fence. Build a fence around your land. If you have no idea what your land looks like, you don't know how to distinguish your land from your neighbor's land, it's gonna be really hard for you to understand where it makes sense to build a fence because you don't really know what's within your property. And the same is true of someone who doesn't have a particularly strong and robust sense of this is who I am. You don't know where to put up boundaries because you don't really know where you end and someone else begins. And so I think that for the anxiously attached type in particular, a really valuable exercise can be just thinking to yourself, how would I design my life if I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was never going to meet my person, that some spell had been cast on me at birth that showed with 100% certainty, my soulmate is not on their way, my partner is not arriving, I'm going to live the rest of my life without a romantic relationship. How would you prioritize your life if that were true? What would you spend your life doing day to day? Which platonic relationships would you strengthen with family members or with friends or with community members? Where would you start devoting your time and attention in areas where maybe you've neglected a little bit in the past? What would you do with your career? Which hobbies might you take up? What would you do with the abundance of time that you have spent the majority of your life using to fixate on other people's behavior? And the clearer you can get on the answer to that, the more you'll start to understand why it's important to have boundaries. Because if you want all of these things for your life, if you now have goals, interests, other relationships that are really important to you, now when you go into a romantic relationship, you're not going in totally vulnerable, right? You're going in partially vulnerable, which again is really important, but also partially protected and boundaried. And you need to know in order to have a healthy relationship, how to switch between those two states, as well as when it's appropriate to be in which one. It is great to be in an open, 
undefended, vulnerable state of existence in situations where we're reasonably sure that we're emotionally safe around another person. But it's not a good thing to go in undefended to situations that we're not sure are safe for us yet. And for a secure person, it generally takes a little while to figure out, okay, when and where is it a good time for me to let my guard down? And where do I need to stay a little bit protected? And again, in a secure partnership, you need to know when it's time to step out of that vulnerable, willing to be taught energy and understand, okay, right now, maybe my partner needs me to be the adult. So maybe right now it's my turn to take what I'm feeling, put it aside, be regulated and be there for someone else, right? To step into that teacher role as well as the student role at different points in time. But if you're exceptionally good at being in that open, vulnerable student role and completely and totally incompetent at stepping into that self-regulated boundary role, what you have is a tricycle that's going around in circles endlessly. The way to fix it is not by pumping up that wheel of fixation on others and getting clearer and clearer on what type of partner you wanna have. It's about inflating that other wheel, that part of yourself that tells you, this is who I am, this is what matters to me, and therefore this is the type of relationship I'm looking for and which boundaries I'm going to need to have in place within any romantic relationship I get into. And only once that wheel is really inflated are you going to be able to move forward in a way that makes sense and actually gets you closer to the type of relationship you want. So I'm gonna say this in plain language one more time. If you are anxiously attached and you get out of a bad relationship and the only preparation work you do around how to prepare for your next relationship is to get more and more specific about the traits you want your partner to have, you are setting yourself up for failure in your next relationship. You need to be balancing out what type of partner you're looking for with information about who you are, what matters to you in life completely outside of a partnership, and how you are going to keep that part of yourself firmly intact in your next relationship. And this means you should have some significant deal breakers. All healthy people do. So then when you go into your next relationship, instead of just sitting there on the first date going like, oh, please don't be toxic, please don't be toxic, you can go into the first date being like, hey, I really hope that this person shares my interests and passions. I hope that we get along because we like to talk about the same types of things. I hope that our values and long-term goals are aligned. And if they're not, cool, maybe I make a friend. And that thought isn't threatening because I'm not expecting this relationship to be the thing that redeems me. I took the time, I really got to know myself, I redeemed my relationship with myself, and now I feel like a pretty cool, competent, confident person who's looking for an equal, and who will be perfectly okay if that person doesn't come along for a long time, because you have a life full of people and goals and activities that you genuinely love, to the same extent that you currently might love the idea of finding an ideal partner. And the cool thing about coming in with that energy is you don't need your partner to be perfect because you can kind of switch back and forth, right? When your partner is in a bad mood, when they're frustrated, when you are having a disagreement with them, because you know how to step out of that vulnerable open energy and into that self-protective boundary energy, you can give your partner the space that they need when things get tense. You can go to your friends, to your work, to that life you have outside of your partnership and regulate there instead of needing all of your regulation and all of your sense of self to come through your partnership. So now when things are dicey in your partnership, it's one area of your life that is struggling. It's not your entire self-concept going down with that ship, right? which means there's a lot less pressure on things going wrong. And when we take a lot of that pressure off, it's a lot easier for a relationship to thrive. All right, that's all I have for today on anxious attachment and what tends to keep this attachment style going in circles endlessly in relationships. As always, any questions you have, please leave in the comments below. I love you guys. I hope you're taking care of yourselves and your inner children and each other. And I will see you back here again really soon.